I just handed out a document that Mr. Connell just gave me um, regarding the formula for local share for fiscal 20. He's only here for like 10, 15 minutes because then he's got to run. So if people want to look at it and if you have questions, yeah, have fire, meeting. fire away. I have another meeting in the library in a little while. So um, it came, the, the overall budget was a 2.34% increase on expenditures and the overall impact to the taxpayers is 4.8%. Uh, and the reason for the difference is because the, the piece for the taxpayers is just on the money that the taxpayers, the state pays about 50 and a quarter percent, so the remaining portions minus some of the revenue sources and so forth. If you look at what the taxpayers are paying this year, 18, 19, and compare it to the 1920 years, to the 1920 perspective, it would be a 4.8 percent increase. Uh, it accounts for um, things like we have a, uh, a bus cycle that's been down over the past years and we haven't been able to earn any uh, replacement cycles from the state. They were working on buses in some districts that were 16, 17 years old and our oldest buses were 13, 14 years old. So we weren't qualifying for that. Um, we have four large buses and two mini buses in our cycle for next year lease purchase and we will we have been uh, notified that we'll receive state subsidy for two large and one small but you don't get the money in the year that it's approved in case it doesn't end up going through if a referendum doesn't pass and you have to come back and there are changes and so forth so um, until that's all in place we won't actually see the funds for it until 2021. Um, also, we have uh, some funds in there to do work on. Uh, I was just meeting just now before I came here with the architects for RFQs on uh, a, a different uh, a replacement school for Lebanon Elementary, uh, additions to North Berwick Elementary School, and an addition to Huzzy Elementary. So impacting all three of the towns. Um, <clears throat> we're working on internally, not going the, RF, uh, the RFQ route or RFPs, we're working internally on construction uh, phase three for the middle school, 1968 construction, bringing that up to code and completing some final asbestos removal. Um, um, doing some uh, further renovations to, to ensure that the school will be structurally safe and sound for the next 30 years is our, our goal. That's what we shoot for. Um, we also have uh, funds in there because the high school is going, uh, seven years ago their population had dipped and so they went from three teams in, per grade level to two teams. The eighth and ninth grade over the next couple of years will be back to the 260, 270 number. So they'll be um, looking, next year we'll add one more team to the high school and then the year after we'll look to add another one. And each person that you put into the budget in the teaching perspective is 69,000 that we estimate. That's about level four in a bachelor scale plus the benefit packages. Um, we, we responded in our contract work with uh, negotiations with AFL-CIO and with um, support staff regarding the January 2020 change in um, the minimum wage that will happen and where that impacts us and which, which groups are going to be impacted by that. Um, so we've addressed those sorts of things in the budget, just a, just a little flavor of it. Um, also, the M multiple pathways program that is for students who are off track in the high school level has been around 30, 35 students for the past three years, and they received a $750,000 grant two years, uh, they er earned that two years ago, and we've had the first year of expenditure. This is the second, second year coming up, and so they give you like 350 ahead. And then uh, let's say it's a 250 and, and whatever. So 
there's a little bit of a buy down on that. You begin to absorb some of the positions. Their goal, the Barr Family Foundation of Massachusetts goal, is to help us build that program up to about 105 students and address needs across grades 9 through 12 instead of just 11 and 12. Um, they, they appreciate the system enough, uh, what we're doing in that program. So there are, and then the, the contract negotiations pieces that are fixed cost for us at this time represent the 4.8. The biggest difference in that though is that um, we receive, we'll be receiving an extra $730,000 in our state subsidy for this coming school year, 1920, but our total change in revenue will be an increase of $8,000. We had uh, $425,000 last year uh, in, in the planning for this year's budget that we used to offset taxes, so the board knew that that would be a hole at the time. And then also $300,000 in paving that happened in the spring last year to take care of Knowlton School and some of the some of the middle school and a couple of other smaller projects, um, transportation back lot. So that's uh, 740 or whatever whatever numbers I was just giving you there. But we're we're gonna we don't have that same kind of money in this anticipated in this year's fund balance by June 30th to put forward to continue that. We're, on, we're I think we're putting forward uh, 300, 325,000. So we're not filling that hole that was created. So it just moved it from last year to this year and, and we kind of expected that could be a possibility, but we hoped it wouldn't be, it is. So um, even though we got the increase in, in, in subsidy, we have a significant decrease on the revenue side of it and then with the fixed cost that drives it up to a 4.8 without the fund balance hole it would have been uh 2.2.25 2.3 something in that range so this document right here that you're looking at is uh the state valuation <clears throat> when you look at that that is from the fiscal 2020 state ED 279 document. That's the one that they give the schools that say, here's what your essential programs and services is gonna look like, here's our numbers. So if you, Berwick for instance, if you looked at your property valuation on the municipal side, you might say, hey, that's not the number that we have. It's the number they provide us in our ED 279 though. And then also um, under the pupil valuation, <coughs> pupil determination, uh, we don't have too many halves, quarters, and three quarters of kids, but that's because it's done over at least a two-year range to help take the fluctuation in students that can impact you drastically in your subsidy and try to even that flow out a little bit more. So that is the 18 and 19 average student counts. Uh, next year at the high school, for instance, we're anticipating having 3,000 12 students in the, in the year after that, 3,053. So we're, that's why we're talking about different teaming structures that'll need to be put in place. Um, I'm gonna, I've got a schedule. I think Jen has already been in contact with the three towns. Has she been in contact with you folks about my coming out to say hi and talk budget? And She's in email. <coughs> okay, great, great. So we got something in the works, Dwayne, are we? Up and, and Laura, we're okay, yeah. okay, super. So I look forward to an opportunity to come out and see what kinds of questions folks have. If you have any that you would like me to make sure that that evening I can respond to those, if you wouldn't mind, if you have some plan in advance that you could send me, I can make sure I can dig up the exact information. Otherwise than that, if there's something that I'm, I'm feeling eh, not quite sure on that answer, it's something I can get back to you on after the meetings. Steve, do you have any idea approximately how many uh, staff are gonna be impacted by the increase in the minimum wage? Um, so what, what we've done in that is it's not it's not so much that we have people who are, by January of 20, are gonna be at the $12 range, right. but when you have somebody who's uh, 
uh, an educational technician one who's at the uh, 1385 to $14 range. So we've taken some of those lower ends and we've moved those up to move them away further because otherwise, in this essence, that right, threshold just got a lot closer right. to them. Mm -hmm. So as far as numbers are concerned, it's uh, food service staff um, would be impacted almost across the board. Um, educational technician ones, clerks, um, bus monitors, and, and, and I think, yeah, I think out of the, for instance, out of the 177 people in the support staff contract, I think we'd be talking probably 70 people on that list. So, the, so 70 people will see a fairly decent increase over, because it's not just you know straight right. across right. like right. a three percent. It's you're, you got another year's experience, so you go over right. and right. and down. Yeah. Yeah. Make sense? And, oh yeah. And um, is I'm, I'm assuming you're not. I'm assuming you're not assuming the state's going to increase their uh, aid to 55 percent. Uh, no, we're at 50.25-ish, something right, right around there right now. And the division of Augusta, you know, about you know, doing that. It, I was up there the other day talking to some legislators, and it doesn't sound like it's it, going to be anything going that way. Yeah, we don't, we don't have, uh, I don't have any indicators right now that that's something that could come out of the 129th legislature. So. And for town manager, it is... Uh, I don't expect to see an increase in the revenue share. Half a percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe. What was that? Half a Half percent. percent. Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do with a half a percent? Okay. It's better than minus half a percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I look forward to the opportunity to uh, meet with all of you folks and see what kind of questions you have. I hate to drop and run, but I've got to, uh, in just a few minutes, I've got to be ready to call a vote uh, for motions on the, uh, the warrants. So I uh, appreciate your time. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm part of this meeting. <laughs> So next, next up, um, so tonight I, uh, we had two topics that we wanted to do, um, which was solar and LED streetlights conversions. Um, it was things that we were looking at, and I thought I reached out to see what maybe other towns were looking at. So um, we got the yes, and so I brought in two people. Um, I brought in Nick Sampson, who will be up first. He's out of Revision Energy, um, out of Portland. He's out of the Portland office. Uh, Revision is a full-service renewable energy contractor that provides a full range of engineering, design, installation, and equipment services for homeless businesses, municipal buildings, and nonprofits. Uh, they're trusted as an industry leader in solar design, installation, and service in Northern New England. Uh, they achieve their vision by maintaining the highest standards of technical accomplishments and customer satisfaction. Uh, they have projects throughout New England, um, and I believe they recently just did a, uh, they have had done a couple projects right here in Elliott. Um, so uh, it's a little bit more complicated, solar is, because there's a lot of site issues and things like that. So this is more of a big picture type on the solar side. Um, I think the uh, LED later on will get it down a little bit, we'll get a little bit finer tune on that. Uh, so anyways, without further ado, uh, Nick Sampson. And, and thanks for, for having me here tonight to present. Um, the So, uh, as Chip mentioned, my name's Nick Sampson. Uh, I'm a commercial solar consultant with Revision Energy. Um, and so this presentation basically provides an introduction to, to solar, uh, solar in Maine, and then it gets into some of the financing options for, for municipal solar projects or towns looking to invest in solar. Um, and then it shares just some of the some of the projects that we've done to date. Um, I'll keep it very casual, so please feel free to bring up any questions or comments as we go. Would it be all right if we just go down with a, with kind of a quick introduction of everybody, just so I can get familiar with where I'll folks are from? Awesome. Tom Wright, Chairman of Board and Berwick. There it is. Ed Vineyard, Selectman Berwick. Steve Lieber from Affinity LED Lighting. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Johnson, Jr., Selectman North Berwick. Awesome. Mike Johnson, Senior, Slightman, North Burr. Dwayne Moore, Town Manager, North Burr. Paul Pilgrim, Chair. Awesome. 
Laura Bragg, Vice Chair of Lebanon, and I work in Elliott. Town Elliott. Very nice. In Chip Yes, yeah. Very nice. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so Chip, Chip gave a very nice introduction to Revision Energy, but um, so I'll just kind of cruise through these slides. But um, Revision is, we're, a, we're an employee-owned solar company. Uh, we were started back in 2003 up in Liberty, Maine. Uh, we were originally just two gentlemen working out of uh, one garage and, and a box truck. Um, and we've since expanded to a company that now employs over 250 people across Maine, uh, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Um, since 2003, we've installed more than 7,000, or and now we're up to about 8,000 systems across northern New England. Um, did, did, and we did a we did a, a solar celebration for the Elliott uh, project. Did, were any of you in attendance for that project? I no. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Did, did you did you work on the or see hear about the project taking place at all? Yes. Okay. Very nice. Um, anyone else in attendance for that or see any news coverage of that? Um, so I'll, I'll just share uh, at the end some of the some of the other municipalities in addition to Elliott that we've uh, that we've worked with uh, for for um, for municipalities um, and so all of the systems that we work on um, the the work that we do is carried out in house by our teams of electricians engineers um, designers and installers um, back in 2015 we were really excited to earn a B Corp or um, uh, B Corporation certification. Um, it's basically awarded to for-profit companies that proactively focus on positive social um, and environmental change for their communities. A couple of recognizable B Corps include Patagonia uh, and, and Ben and & Jerry's uh, for any ice cream lovers up there. Um, Last year, we were really excited to earn uh, number one rooftop solar installer uh, in New England um, and number five in the country uh, by Solar Power World magazine. So we were really excited about that. Um, and we, Revision is a mission-driven company. So our mission is to transition um, or, ex sorry, accelerate or lead the transition away from an imported fossil fuel-based economy to a local clean energy economy. Um, so in addition to, to uh, solar electric systems, we also work with other technologies that we feel pairs really well with, um, with solar. Things like air source heat pumps, um, uh, hot water technology, electric vehicle charging stations, batteries, stuff like that. Any, any questions about, uh, about revisions or, so, or any other questions so far? So this slide behind me shows one of the biggest things that's happened with solar over the last 10 years. Um, so the yellow curve shows how the cost of solar has come down by uh, more than 75% over the last decade. Um, and that has, has driven widespread adoption um, for all types of customers, whether it's residential, commercial, or municipal, or, or nonprofit. Um, and that's represented by the blue bar graph for, for installations across the U.S. So while it's great that the cost of solar has come down by so much, we still do get some questions uh, in the region about whether or not we have a good enough solar resource um, to, to make this technology really cost effective and really viable. So while Maine might not have uh, the same solar resource as the French Riviera, um, this, this next map shows how we actually are on a similar latitude to some areas of the Mediterranean. Um, and we also like to compare our solar resource to that of Germany's. So on an annual basis, uh, Maine receives roughly 30% more sunlight than Germany does. Um, and why we believe that that's important is because uh, Germany has been the worldwide leader in solar energy installations um, up, until, up until very recently um, with China and the U.S. ramping up. Um, over the last few years, Germany has seen a um, uh, some situation or a few periods of time where uh, the majority of their energy consumption in, in the country is met by almost all renewables, a combination of, of wind in the northern part of the country and solar in the southern part of the country. Um, so we see this as really encouraging for where, where we can go with, with, um, with solar in, in the region. Have you all seen solar energy systems uh, out there, whether rooftop or, or ground mount? Um, there, there are quite a few around, uh, more popping up. And so the major components that are involved with, with the system are, of course, the panels that you might see up on a roof or, or in a field for a ground mount. 
Um, they come in typically two sizes. Um, they're made of, uh, the frame is, is aluminum and the, the cover is tempered glass. Um, so they're, they're really robust, um, long lasting uh, uh, pieces of equipment. Um, they will, they basically produce direct current electricity um, and they send that to the second component, major component involved in a solar energy system um, that's called the inverter system. Uh, the inverter system converts that DC electricity to alternating current or AC electricity. Um, the panels are expected to last about 40 years. They come with a 25 year production warranty. Um, studies have shown that they will exceed manufacturer's expectations um, and basically have looked at systems and panels installed back in the 1980s that are still producing the majority of their maximum power output. Um, the invert, oh yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, something I had read a while ago is that the, uh, the panels lose their effectiveness over time. Absolutely. So is, uh, yeah. what's that rate? Is yeah, usually it's about half a percent per year is, is kind of uh, industry standard for expectations. Over 40 years, you lose 20%. Yep, exactly right. So, um, so yeah, just like anything that lives in the sun, they slowly wear down over time. And uh, those same studies have found that the, the median degradation rate for, for um, I'm, it may be about 2,000 either panels or systems across installed across uh, the planet um, during a certain time period, 1980s to 2010 or so, um, have a median degradation rate of about half a percent. Um, so the the production warranties now are will guarantee uh, about 85 percent. So it's a linear production warranty, but they'll guarantee after 25 years about usually it's close to 85 uh, percent. There are some that are 86 percent of their maximum power output after that time. Um, and then the inverter systems, they, they usually come with a 10 or 12 year warranty and those are expected to last about 20 years. Uh, but they represent a small portion of the initial project cost. Um, so we always let customers know that they should expect to replace the inverter system once during the, the project lifespan. Um, and we'll include that if we were to provide a proposal with a uh, savings estimate, that's always included in our, our cash flow and our savings estimate. So. One thing that we really like about, about solar is how simple these systems are. So um, with these being the major components, there, there are no moving parts um, and the systems are, are very long, long lasting um, and really don't, other than the inverter replacement, don't have any significant operating or maintenance requirements. So um, they're a great, great opportunity to, to lock in a long-term supply of, of clean energy really cost effectively. It, you know, it, um you haven't mentioned anything about batteries, so your systems all plug into the grid. The grid. That's that's the per perfect segue into this slide. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I, uh, I, I investigated yeah. solar for myself a while ago, and, and nice. know, the batteries were the huge expense. And everybody said, "Well, how often do you lose power?" I said, "A couple of times a year." I said, "Why do you need batteries?" Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly right. So, so about ninety nine percent of the projects that we install are grid tied projects. Um, so. There, there are, this is kind of a side note, that we are starting to work with more and more uh, battery systems with our, with our projects just because the cost has come down so much for lithium ion technology. Um, but most of the, most of the systems um, are, um, do not have batteries involved. And as I mentioned, about 99% are grid tied. They don't cut the tie with the, with the grid. So, so the way that those systems work is, is basically when the, when the sun's shining, um, the panels will produce uh, that, that solar electricity, which will flow through the inverters and into the electrical system of the building. Um, and whenever there's any, any usage going on in the building, that solar electricity is gonna feed that on-site usage first. Um, so the electricity follows the path, uh, path of least resistance, kind of like water. Um, when solar production exceeds on-site consumption, that excess solar generation is gonna be sent back to the grid. Um, through a, a separate meter, and the utility will read uh, all of the all of the electricity that's being sent back to the grid, and give the solar customer a credit for every kilowatt hour of excess solar generation. Then, at times when uh, uh, use on site is higher than solar generation, like like getting into the evening or or a cloudy day uh, during the summer or snow covered time during the winter. Um, 
the building simply draws from the grid like normal, and those credits that have been, been built up um, from those periods of excess generation are simply applied to the customer's bill at the end of every billing period. So that's called that's called net billing or net energy. Um, uh, sorry, net metering or net energy billing um, in Maine, and basically that allows uh, that eliminates really or reduces the incentive to install a battery system because you can use the grid basically as your as your backup. So unless you want clean backup or you want to reduce, uh, if you're a big user of electricity and have certain charges that aren't offset by solar, um, you, you, there's really not a huge incentive for, for batteries. So. Are there some legislative changes going or look, being looked at right now about net metering? I yeah. thought I heard some stuff. That yeah, and, and they've actually been successful, which we're really excited about. So they recently signed it into place where, so a couple of years ago, the main PUC um, reduced the credit value uh, for solar customers when they set, when they produce a, an electron or a kilowatt hour of, of um, solar. Um, they reduced it to about 90%. It would be about 90% um, of a full credit this year. Um, and legislation was just passed to bring that back up to a full 100% credit, uh, which we're really excited about. You can also, so there was also a, and this applies to pretty well to, uh, quite, uh, it applies to towns. Um, with one system, you can offset up to nine other accounts that are owned by the same entity with that solar array. Um, there is some legis uh, there are some bills floating around that have um, basically would lift that limit from nine meters up to uh, roughly 200 meters. It might it might be worked down a little bit or, or go up, um, but that's another another uh, possible policy change that could have a could have a big impact for municipalities. So basically, we could have a so somebody could have a solar farm for say, and then all those credits. Can be used for throughout the entire town for all the different buildings that might be on their own different different accounts or yeah, meters. Yeah, exactly. So for an exa for example, I we did the first step of our process typically for looking into solar for a municipality might be to mm -hmm. review the sites um, that are owned by that that town, but also are to collect the electricity bills um, for that town. And so uh, Chip was kind enough to send along uh, the town of Lebanon's electricity bills. And I think you have maybe nine, it might be perfect, Chip. I think you have about nine accounts, maybe eight or so. So the town of Lebanon, under, even under current policy, could offset all of those accounts with just one array. Um, and, and the same should be true for, for North Berwick and, and for Berwick. Um, and it, it would almost be a guarantee once that, that, that uh, limit of nine meters is increased to 200, so. The bill is a six megawatt farm, but they're looking to increase it to a 20 megawatt farm, which would, that's what they're, that's what's before the legislature right now. Yeah, so increasing the, the max size, yep, exactly. And and so with, with a, and there's a lot of, there are a lot, def, definitely there's a lot of, uh, a lot of bills floating around. Um, one option that could, um, that currently is a little challenging with current, with, with policy as it is today, which could open up if, if there are some nice policy changes is a kind of a community solar farm for municipalities. So rather than just the town of Lebanon having its own solar array that offsets its nine accounts, um, if, it, if it isn't, uh, if it's cost effective enough where um, the decision making process of you know five different towns or, or three different towns is, is smooth enough, um, you could you could group all together to try to take advantage of economies of scale um, in the right applications. And could you do that with a school district as well, up to? Yeah, you probably you, potentially. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then you just have one project on one site um, that's that's sending electricity to each and credit, entity. Credits for for everybody. Yep. Around. Right. Yeah. Exactly right. And the, and that's that's kind of preliminary right now. So it's dependent on some policy change, and we would know. More kind of once that policy is in, is in place, but something that could be explored in the future, absolutely. So one of the fun things that comes with a solar array is a web-based monitoring portal. So um, this is, this shows basically what, what the web-based monitoring will show is, it, it will show instantaneous generation, so power production, the power that the array is putting out uh, at a given time. Daily, daily power generation, which is shown here. Uh, this is a 150 kilowatt ground mount array at the Wells Sanitary District. Um, 
it was, this was in November, it was a really sunny morning as you can see and then it got a little cloudy. Um, and then it, you can look at your daily uh, uh, energy production over the course of a month. Um, as you may recall, November, this is from November as well, and that was a pretty snowy month, so there's a, production was a little bit lower. Um, but then you can look at monthly production as well over the course of the year and compare that year over year. Um, and um, Nick Rico from the superintendent from Wells Sanitary District called me after he sent, kind of sent an update on how their system was doing, and, and they, he let me know that they generated about a thousand kilowatt hours more than we had projected for them. So we had project, projected something like probably close to 200 kilowatt, 200,000 kilowatt hours a year, and they had done about a thousand, a thousand more. So he was, he was psyched. So um, in addition to being made up of really simple components that are robust and long lasting, solar energy systems are, uh, the production is, is really, um, or the performance is really predictable. So we'll take 30 years of weather data from the area, uh, sh uh, shading analysis, um, the, basically the pitch and orientation of the panels, and then we'll use our own internal data to come up with an uh, annual production estimate for customers that basically drives the savings estimate. Um, and what we found is that will, that will basically differ from usually the performance estimate, uh, or sorry, actual performance differs from the performance estimate by plus or minus 2% over a longer period of time. It, it will vary more, uh, a little higher, uh, by maybe plus or minus 5 to 10% year over year just because weather changes, um, but it's a, it's a uh, very predictable, um, predictable thing, the, the kilowatt hour uh, generation. And if you, if you go with a rooftop project rather than a, a ground mount like they have at Well Sanitary District, um, you also, uh, with today's technology, you would have pan, panel level monitoring. So this is, a, this is panel level monitoring for a rooftop project at Mount, uh, Town of Mount Desert. Um, so you can see, this one isn't as exciting, but if there's like shade on one side of the roof or different pitches, you can see how that impacts uh, generation. Um, it's all pretty pretty steady across the entire all the panels here for this one. So, in addition to falling costs driving the adoption of, of solar across across Maine and the country, um, there are also um, some some federal ta federal tax benefits that um, anyone with a tax liability can take advantage of. So, uh, residential solar customers can take advantage of a thirty percent federal tax credit. Um, business owners get, can take advantage of the, a 30% federal tax credit as well, and they can also depreciate that 40-year that, uh, asset in year one, which usually results in another 20% savings um, through tax benefits. Um, just a quick side note, that 30% tax credit is stepping down to 26% in 2020, um, then it's stepping down to 22% uh, in um, 2020. 21, and then it's 10% in 2022. So it's slowly reducing over, over time or is scheduled to, to reduce down to that 10%, um, which it will be indefinitely unless, unless policy, federal policy changes. Um, but so while it's great that those tax benefits are available to, to businesses and homeowners, uh, of course, unfortunately they are, are not available to the non-tax main entities like, like municipalities. Um, so that's where a, um, uh, financing option comes in called the Power Purchase Agreement or the PPA. Um, so the Power Purchase Agreement was developed um, to basically help non-tax paying entities indirectly take advantage of their of those tax incentives um, and in doing so it can speed up the payback period of a solar energy project. It also it allows the town to avoid any upfront cost or, or take on additional debt if it, if it was planning to finance the project. So. Um, it, we found in certain situations it can really be um, be, be quite attractive to, to main municipalities. It's used across the country. Um, in fact, a lot of actually uh, big businesses will will use it, um, like like Google and Apple will enter into power purchase agreements for huge procurements of of uh, solar and, and wind um, energy. Um, Revision started working with power purchase agreements back in 2011. Um, we basically saw um, nonprofits and towns and, and schools as, as other really mission-driven organizations that, that were in very interested in solar but really couldn't make it, make it work without those, those tax benefits. Um, and so we wanted to do what we could to try to help um, 
them invest in, in solar. How long do you typically do a purchase agreement for? Does it for forty years or? Yeah, usually it's for twenty five years. Twenty five. Yeah. Years. So it's a great another another great segue into the next slide. I should I will I'll uh, hire you for uh, for the next presentation. Um, yeah, so, so basically what's involved in, in the power purchase agreement is, is rather than, than buying the system outright, like I mentioned, the town would have a, um, a third party investor finance it on behalf of the town. Um, that investor could be a, 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 another mission driven impact investor from New England. So Revision is actively looking for uh, impact investors to, to finance our funds that, that finance then these PPAs. So they provide the, the capital and the tax liability. Um, it could also be a, a larger mission driven or uh, company that's looking to basically finance these or invest in uh, kind of low carbon um, uh, projects. Um, and so, so basically that investor finances the project on behalf of the town and the town licenses the site for solar to that, to that investor so they can access it for the installation, um, maintenance um, and, and annual inspections. And um, then the town purchases all of the solar electricity that's produced, generated by the array at a rate that's specified uh, basically uh, in, in the power purchase agreement and, and agreed to by the town and the and the investor. Ideally, that rate is is set at um, a basically to be competitive with what the town is currently paying for electricity from the grid, or at a discount. So um, we always love if we can offer an immediate savings um, uh, through a power purchase agreement. Um, sometimes, just depending on the rates that a town is paying or the the type of project, we find that that might be more chal challenging to hit, and we would have that conversation up front to say, you know, this might involve a premium, or you, do you still want to look into this? Um, but we're finding that it can be it can be very attractive and offer that savings right away. Yeah. It, you know, from your viewpoint, is it better for a rooftop installation or a land base? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it kind of depends on what's available. Um, so if you have, and, and what you're trying to offset for usage. So if you have the space, um, and you have pretty much a, uh, a perfect roof that has great orientation, good pitch, um, is this really simple installation, doesn't need the roof replacement, doesn't need any structural upgrades, is easy interconnection. Brand new fire station. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that is... that is uh, With a flat roof. Oh, awesome, yeah. With no shade. So that, yeah, so that's a great, that's definitely a great place where we would start. Um, and then if you're limited by what you have for rooftops, then we would look at ground mounts. So, tr Traditionally, and, and if you're at a smaller scale, uh, it's, rooftop is always more cost effective than ground mounts. But what, once you get into a larger scale, like if you're um, offsetting the load of a town, you're getting into a, an area where uh, ground mount might be just as cost effective as the rooftop. So it kind of, it, it just depends on the site the specific, uh, specifically and, and the situation. So. It is, say, say we wanted to put one on our new fire station. Yeah. How much would we have to increase the uh, load rating on the roof? Yeah, so if, if it's a flat roof, it would be about seven pounds per square foot is what we usually expect the, the additional dead weight or dead load to be. Um, for a pitch roof, it's about three pounds per square foot. Um, so good question. The, um, and, and so the power purchase agreement, as I mentioned, is, is uh, lasts for 25 years typically. So that's the standard term. There are usually options for five-year extensions. So you could have one or two options for five-year extensions. Um, and during the power purchase agreement, I mentioned the town would buy the, the solar electricity from the, from the investor. Um, the investor would be responsible for everything else. So they would, they would own their array and they would operate it and maintain it. So basically, they would do an annual, typically an annual inspection, um, an annual report on how the system is doing. They would, and they would be responsible if there are any, any issues with the array. Um, so while we don't expect there to be many issues, that option uh, takes, takes all the risk away from the town and puts it on the, on the investor. Um, then after the first five years of the power purchase agreement, the town would have the opportunity to purchase the system at, um, at, at a discounted cost, at, at fair market value. 
um, and usually that's right around 60% of the initial installation cost. So basically the, the investors are, they're recovering their investment through those tax benefits and the energy payments from the town um, and then they can, that's why they can sell it at a discounted amount um, in year six. So municipalities have the opportunity to basically um, lock in a, a supply of electricity uh, where the pricing is ideally less than what they're, what they're paying um, over 25 years um, for, for electricity from the grid and they have uh, basically price stability and price transparency in a PPA. Um, they also would have the opportunity to buy out and that would basically, once you buy the system um, and assume ownership, you're no longer paying the investor for that, for that electricity and you haven't been paying the utility and that's, that's an option for delivering uh, higher savings to the town. Um, so if you have the ability to do that, um, so. People actually opt to purchase. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, that's a great question. So with a lot of the municipalities that we've worked with, so most of them, I mentioned we started in 2011 with PPAs. Um, the the initial customers that have reached their the buyout option, I believe, all have chosen to buy out. Um, so actually, Elliot did a phase one project on their uh, public works garage, and they bought that. Um, just recently, uh, after right around the time that their, their landfill project was installed, um, those are and so at smaller scale, I think so. Basically, in the range of anywhere from maybe like ten to ten to hundred kilowatts, or or even up to maybe two hundred fifty kilowatts, most customers plan to purchase the the project. Um, at a larger scale, um, I think we're seeing more customers that are so projects that are big ground mounts that are maybe a megawatt in scale. And I'll show you kind of some systems with, with the system size to give you an idea. But uh, we're expecting those customers to be more interested in just letting the investor own those and, and having that stable electricity pricing and, and, and being able to, to um, use solar, solar energy versus energy from the grid. The, the purchase option is written into the contract? Yep. Yeah, so you would have the option to, to buy out. Um, it would be, I mentioned it would be at fair market value um, and you wouldn't, it's not, so it, no obligation to buy out in year six. Um, that's the earliest option. But then you would have several opportunities to reconsider that decision um, if you chose not to buy out in year six. And, and the later you get in the power purchase agreement, the lower the buyout amount is. So, And, and the ways that we've, um, we understand a lot of municipalities are planning to buy out is either by bonding the buyout um, and if it's a really good project um, and you have and you have access to a, a nice low rate um, ideally once you bond the buyout I think this will we expect this to work out for Elliot um, the energy savings exceed the bond payment um, once you bond that buyout so you're essentially I'll show you in a second but you can stay revenue neutral for the lifetime of the project um, and, while still acquiring ownership of it. Um, once, once there's a buyout, who, who uh, is responsible? Who do you go to for maintenance, annual maintenance? Yeah, so you could, you could, hire, you could hire a solar company for an annual maintenance, or uh, operations and maintenance. Um, and your company does? Agreement. We do, yeah. And it's preventative maintenance, so we would do like an annual inspection and an annual report. Um, some customers might choose not to do that and just call us or another solar company if if issues come up with the with the array to have them fixed basically. So. And then the other option that um, seems to be popular, uh, if it's if it's doable, is for for preparing for the buyout is to save to put away a reserve fund where you're saving a fifth of the buyout if you plan to buy out in year six or say it's year ten and. and a uh, tenth of the buyout or a ninth of the buyout um, to have the capital to, to purchase the system um, eventually. So, so this this uh, graph here just basically shows um, the power the, the savings opportunity of the power purchase agreement with a year six buy, buyout as compared to the outright purchase of the system. And this was I basically took the town of Lebanon's um, annual energy consumption across all of its accounts then just ran through a really preliminary uh, project and, and PPA pricing for that, for that system. Um, but basically this, I found that most, we, if we find a good site, we would expect the town to have the opportunity to, to um, enter a PPA at a discount 
um, sort of discounted rate. So uh, slight savings basically in years one through five um, if they enter the power purchase agreement, sorry, which is shown by the, the yellow co curve. Um, so they can avoid that, say say it's a $200,000 project, which this graph kind of shows with the purchase. They can avoid that upfront cost and see savings immediately. And then they can buy this the project for say, um, if it's $200,000, say $120,000 in year six rather than $200,000. Um, after the point of purchase, if it was just the out, an outright per, uh, buyout, we would expect the system to pay, the, or, or the buyout to pay itself back in about, usually it's six to 10 years, depending on, depending on the project. Um, and so you can imagine it for, for bonding, oh, that's perfect. Uh, the, if they were to bond um, and the energy sa savings cover the, cover the debt payments, basically this line just keeps on slowly cutting across here until the, until the bond's paid off and then it's, and then it's revenue uh, or, or more extensive savings for the town. You know the discount rate was? What, so, what's the discount rate coming in at? Uh, the discount rate? So when you say, oh, 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 yeah, so, um, the, so the town pays, is paying about, and, and um, I might be a little bit more conservative with this than, just because it's not going to be site. So the town's paying, so if you find like kind of an ideal site, uh, maybe a two cent uh, discount um, per kilowatt hour, and the town's paying about. Off standard rate, is that what you have to talk to the exact discount? Is off standard. Off standard. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. so the town's paying, I think, 14 point. 14.8 cents on average, um, so two cents off of off of that um, was the rough idea that I had. It could be better than that because um, I'm trying to be conservative. Or sorry, yeah, um, it could be it could be um, worse if we can't find it want find a good site. So, but just to give you an idea. So um, another way to just look at uh, the savings opportunity. This graph just compares. The cost of, of not doing solar, um, so utility cost over over 40 years, basically of um, of that energy that would be offset by the solar array. Um, as you can see, we included 2.5 percent escalator um, with the utility rate, and then the savings are shown in green, and the and the all in PPA cost is shown in, in shown in yellow there. And and so one final way to to look at this is is just to take the cost of every kilowatt hour that's that we expect to be produced by the array over 40 years, and compare that to what the utility rate is now and what we expect the utility rate to be on average over 40 years. So we take uh, two different scenarios of the PPA: the PPA with the year year six buyout, and then the term PPA. So taking the PPA to 25 years, as well as the outright purchase. And we take the all-in cost of each scenario and we just divide that by the total energy production that we expect over 40 years. So you can see that basically it, that these, any of these financing options provide the, the opportunity to lock in this long-term supply of clean energy at, a, um, at an overall lower cost than, than what you are currently paying for electricity from the grid and where, definitely where we expect rates to go in, in the future with that 2.5% escalator. And I, just to skip, I'll skip back through, but so um, since I mentioned the 2.5% escalator, we, we basically look at, uh, to come up with that number, we look at his, what's, gone, what's happened with rates historically. Um, so we look at the past uh, 30 years, um, and that's shown from 1990 to 2018 on this graph here, what's happened with rates in New England. Um, so they've gone up and, and been fairly volatile. Um, and then we look at the Energy Information Administration's outlook on where rates are expected to go over the next 20 years, and they expect about a 2.5% escalator. Over the last 10 years in Maine, rates have gone up by about 3.1%. Um, and with Standard Offer, they, they, as you may be well aware, they did a big jump of, I think, like 7% or something like that this last year. So that's where we come up with that 2.5% number that's included there. Um, so I mentioned that the, the, op the options of the financing partners or the, the investors, um, and, and one of them being a, possibly an impact investor or a group of impact investors from New England. So traditionally, Revision actually financed a lot of our PPA projects ourselves, and we used our own tax liability and, and capital um, to, to finance those projects. Um, and we could, 
reduce the, we could basically take barely any return um, and our benefit on the PPA and the financing side and our benefit was we got to install the project and help a town or, or school do solar or, or nonprofit. Since we became employee owned, we no longer have a tax liability. So that's why we are working with impact investors from across New England who are willing to take a lower return than commercial investors um, and basically looking to do the right thing and, and, and help with the adoption of solar um, across across the area. So um, this this main biz article just uh, discusses that. And in two, last year, we financed, including the town of Elliott, about $2 million worth of projects through the Impact Investor Program. Our goal for this year, 2019, if I can remember what year it is, is to do about $10 million of, of projects and to keep that to keep that going. So um, based on the, kind of the size of, of these municipalities, unless you were to group together into a much larger project, I'd expect that to be the finance, the, the, the investor option for, for um, these three towns. Um, revision energy is indifferent to how you finance the project. So um, if, 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 if basically a town has the capital to, to buy a system outright or it's more comfortable bonding and has, it can achieve a great rate and it's, a, it's just a simpler pot process, that's a great option as well, and, and so we'd certainly encourage that. With the power purchase agreement, we just we like to bring another option to the uh, to the table that doesn't involve that capital expense or or that uh, the additional debt. Um, this slide just shows kind of what it might look like for the outright purchase of a system or or financing it with a 15 year 15 year bond if you have a good good rate and if it's a good project. Ideally, the 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 um, the loan shown by the darker curve, the blue curve, um, would would allow the town to stay revenue neutral. It, that's highly dependent, kind of on on the project and, and the situation, the offset rate. So, but definitely, uh, you have those financing options as as well. Um, in addition to the savings opportunity that we see with these projects, um, we also believe that there's a great uh, opportunity for community engagement and educational opportunities. And we're always really excited to, to help um, um, towns or schools or nonprofits take advantage of those opportunities, whether it's doing ribbon cuttings like we did with the town of Elliott, um, press releases, educational materials, um, doing tours with the local students of the, of the system. We, we've done that a lot in Portland and South Portland with their landfill projects. Um, and really, really anything else, solar events. Um, a lot of times, we'll just have our we'll have our marketing team meet with um, the town or or um, a non nonprofit to to come up with ideas, and we're happy to customize those um, if it makes sense. So um, this is just a, a list of the the towns that we have worked with uh, to date, um, and I actually brought a full list um, that's that includes a few more towns. This is. This is all of our, I believe, all of our PPA projects that we've done to date. I mentioned we have worked with um, some some water and wastewater treatment districts as well. So Well Sanitary District, uh, North Berwick Water District, Kennebec Sanitary Treatment District. Um, we went all the way up to the, to, to um, Arusa County to work with uh, limestone water and sewer up there. Um, so just to take you through uh, some of the projects that we've done to date, and then I'll I'll wrap up um, if I'm still all right with with time. Um, so this is a, uh, as you can see, a, a rooftop project that we did for the town of St. George. This is on their transfer station. Um, with all of our, our rooftop, our pitched roof projects, we'll flush mount the array and we'll include about three inches of space, three to four inches of space but below the array, um, and, and or sorry, between the array and the roof. Basically that leaves space for the racking system, which is kind of the backbone of the, of the array, but it also allows for air to pass beneath the panels and they perform much, much better in cooler temperatures than they do uh, in when, they, when they're really hot, um, just like any, any electronics. So we'll, we'll see, as far as power production goes, March and, and sunny days during the fall, like September and October can be, can be really, really high producing uh, periods. It can be great. Uh, another uh, flush mounted rooftop project for the, for the town of Mount Desert. I mentioned uh, uh, them during when I showed the panel level monitoring. Um, these two were both metal roofs, so we'll install metal roofs. And then this is a, a pitched uh, or a flush mounted array installed on an asphalt roof for, for St. Don's in, in Miami. 
shingles. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. my question. It's yeah. Right now. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, so if the, sh if the shingles wear down um, and you need a roof replacement, basically you can take the array down and then put it right back up once the roof replacement's done. That, that is an additional cost, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and so we always recommend, if it's going to be a rooftop top project, um, making sure that the panels are, or, or sorry, that the shingles are, or, or the metal roof is at least, has at least half of its lifetime expectancy left. So you don't you aren't incurring that cost uh, really early on in the project, um, and if not getting a, and if you can't determine that, getting a roof evaluation or having the roof replaced if you find that it's it's too old. So that's a good question. How long does the snow stay? Yeah, another another good question. So uh, it kind of depends on the on the roof and the pitch of the roof. So um, if you have a, obviously if you have a shallower pitch roof. It will stay on for longer, um, and then steeper pitch. They shed pretty quickly, like just like a metal roof um, being made of tempered glass. Um, so, we actually some of the data that we include in our performance estimate is basically the uh, performance loss due to snow cover. So we'll actually factor that in into into our production estimate, um, so that you aren't seeing lower performance just because the panels are covered by snow for lots of January and February. Um, so we like we like the idea that you can just let the sand panel sit on your roof or in the field, and you don't have to worry about ongoing maintenance or and, and uncovering them from snow. So, um, so in addition to doing, uh, we kind of had these mono pitch uh, arrays for the first three that I showed. We can also um, use, of course, multiple rooftops like we did for Bristol Consolidated School. Um, and this is an in-progress shot of a, a rooftop installation for, for the town of Sebago on their salt and sand shed. They actually chose not to find it. They were looking at a power purchase agreement for a long time, um, and they chose to actually bond it So with Bangor Savings Bank. So they decided to go a different route, and uh, so did the city of Belfast recently. So the majority of the towns that we work with have financed it through a PPA, but um, we're seeing a, a couple of towns starting to explore the other options. So in addition to the pitch roofs, so, uh, we can also work on flat roofs as well. So um, these systems would be, rather than being flush mounted, they'd be installed on a pitched uh, racking system that's ballasted to the roof. Um, usually it's a 10 degree pitch um, and ballast blocks basically are hold it down. So ideally we can avoid any, any rooftop penetrations on that membrane roof um, and just ballast it right to the roof. And so this is uh, the other option that we have to work with, a uh, ground-mounted option. So I mentioned the Well Sanitary District project. This is their uh, part of their array that was installed back in 2017. Um, and so we, um, yeah, we have this option if basically customers want to go larger than they can fit on their roof or they just don't have a great rooftop for it. Um, and this is another ground mount project that we did for the town of Camden. Um, this was a, usually we look for um, really nice uh, flat pieces of land that aren't very ledgy, don't have a lot of rock. This is a pretty ledgy site. So we can definitely work on, work on it um, on most sites, um, but we are always trying to find the most cost effective option. Um, this is the first uh, capped landfill in Maine to be developed with solar. Um, so this array is offsetting use, uh, electricity use for the city of Belfast. Um, so they, they did this project back in 2014, um, which we were really excited of, to start using these unusable um, landfills for, for solar. Um, Just thrust block. Oh, sorry. Just thrust blocks that we guys using? Yeah, so these are, yeah, so, so basically these were precast ballasts, uh, ballasts um, that were brought out onto the landfill. Um, and I think they're like 6,500 to 8,500 pounds. So um, that's what we use for the foundation so we don't penetrate the landfill. For this installation, so this was the second landfill, cap landfill to be developed with solar in Maine for, for city of uh, South Portland. With this one, we brought in, we put in forms in place where, the, where we wanted to put the, the ballast and basically had a, um, a truck run, run along this road with a big arm that, that poured cement into those forms um, as a more cost-effective option. So in addition to not being able to penetrate the landfill, we have to uh, make sure that we're not, the work that we do on it and accessing this, the site doesn't um, 
do anything to it doesn't harm the landfill or, or the cap on it. So that was a much more much more cost effective and efficient option for for that for those foundations there and what we're using moving forward. Um, this is the this is the third. Uh, Sorry, it's landfill heavy at the end here, but the third landfill to be capped with, with solar uh, that we've done uh, for the city of South Portland. And the town of Elliott was the fourth, uh, which we, we completed at the end of 2018. So um, we, I mentioned we always love to, to develop landfills with solar because you can't use them for anything else. They do involve a, a higher cost. So um, with those not being able to penetrate them with the installation um, and working with basically working through DEP permitting um, and, and also some more due diligence on the investor side of landfills um, adds a higher upfront cost. And so if we can find a site that's that and there's enough space that's away from the landfill, um, that's usually a great place to start, but we can always look at the land, a landfill if there's good access to it and uh, power that's close by. Just a, one caveat, that's actually what we had looked at originally because we, again, it's like a lot of towns we have a landfill that just sits there. Um, the problem is our town is so small, we don't use enough electricity to offset the cost to do that. If we if we're a bigger town or whatever, right? Yeah. But it's, it's clearly we're just, we're too small, we don't, we don't use enough electricity. Yeah. yeah. It's exactly right. So it was it was usage, and it was also access. I think there's some access, there's some access possibilities, yep. but and power. again, why even go there if you're not going to be able to use that energy? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and so just to give everyone an idea, I think then that's very fairly, fairly common that we might look at one site to start and say, you know, this might not be best. So now, if if Chip's interested, in it, what the next step would involve is going back and looking at other town-owned options, uh, maybe rooftops, maybe ground. And then if, if we find that none of those are ideal, then we would go start thinking about maybe off-site and maybe grouping it together with other, other um, parties that are interested in a power purchase agreement. So, so just to conclude, this is our, our first PPA customer that we, we worked with back in 2011. This is um, the Goodwill Hinckley School. Um, and so this is their then president, uh, Glenn Cummings, saying that every cent that they save on their electric bill goes to scholarships uh, for, for their students who need help, and that, that and that's the biggest win for for them. And so this really just comes back to excuse me to why Revision started working with power purchase agreements uh, just to basically try to help these other mission driven organizations um, meet their solar energy goals if they have those goals. So um, we we I, I'll leave some information if that's all right, as well as my cards, and we'd be happy to I'd be happy to answer any questions or have more uh, conversations later on if, if anybody's interested. Expect an invitation to borrow. Oh, awesome. Very nice. That sounds great. So yes. it, 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 we discussed it a couple meetings ago when we were talking about <coughs> solar and uh, your name came up. So. Oh, awesome. Very nice. Well, I'll, I might just swing by with my card if that's all right. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring that over. Would it be our, would, is anybody interested in seeing our list of uh, municipalities that we've worked with? Is that yeah, I'd love that's that worth it to hand out. I might just pass uh, a few down the line here. Okay, yeah, yeah, perfect. Could you mind if I give you a card? Is that all right? So in the essence of time, I'm going to jump right into the, our next our next person so we can, uh, uh, so it's Steve Lieber. He's the founder and president of Affinity LED Lighting out of Dover, New Hampshire. Uh, Affinity produces the best in class products by providing employment opportunities to those who have served and protected our nation. Their workforce of US veterans assembles Affinity LED Street and parking lot lights at their UL approved manufacturing facility in Dover. These lights combine leading edge LED technology with pragmatic design to create finished products with rated lifetimes 
of over 120,000 operating hours. They have completed projects in Dover, Rochester, Augusta, Kittery, Elliott, and elsewhere in Maine and New Hampshire.